Hello everybody, my name is Reagan Haney. My name is Lainey Mills. And today we're going to be discussing systematic racism in public education. So today we're going to be discussing redlining in America. I actually don't know what that is. Could you explain that to me, please? <laughs> of course. So redlining in America is actually a really big issue that many low-income areas around counties mm -hmm. around the nation that are facing. Okay. And it is where low-income schools are, low-income areas are being placed in schools. Okay. And those kids never get the same opportunities as people in higher income areas, those lower income areas contain more people of color, which turns into a really big, you know. It's a diverse issue, it's, mm -hmm. it's diversity, they're not, it's, you know, they're excluding people out, so I, it's it's kind of turning into like, um, wasn't there an act or a bill like way back mm -hmm. during segregation? Yeah, that's actually something we're going to be discussing okay. later. Right. One thing I want to mention to you as well, and I do have some notes over here. Um, so systematic racism has significantly impacted students across okay. America in low income schools by not allowing them to obtain proper education, not allowing them to get important life skills that they need, and all in all just not getting equal opportunities. So how would you say that they're not getting proper education? Well, because the communities that they, these schools are in, you know, there's just not enough funding. There's mm -hmm. just not enough funding for them to get quality teachers, which allows them to not even get a great quality education. Right. They're not being taught the right things that they need to be taught, like important life skills and everything. Right, right. So is the majority of the minority, are they black or are they Hispanic, they Asian? They are majorly black. Okay. Um, majority of them are black and actually the highest dropout rate for the black community is 6.5%. Wow. Yes. And then for high school? For high school, high school wow. dropout is 6.5%. Wow. What about for white people? Oh, for white people it's 3.9% dropout rate. Wow. So the black okay. people dropout rate is literally double, double. than what white people are. That is insane. Yes, and then when you look at like the predominantly white schools, you know, they have the funding and they have the money that gives them all of these like does, resources. Does the money, you know, resources you say like textbooks, computers, like Basic what? things like that, because even these low income schools are yeah. not even getting computers. Right, or school supplies, anything school like supplies, that. Books. No. No, you know, wow. teachers have to buy their student school supplies and with the schools not paying the teachers enough, they, they can't go and get right. school supplies. Right. Well, I know like both my parents are teachers. They're both educators. You know, my mom does work with, um, she's an AIG teacher, so it's like the, the academically gifted kids. And my dad's a regular high school teacher. Mm -hmm. He teaches high school science. He, biology, chemistry, physics, whatever. But, um, you know, there's been times where they've told me before uh, how they've had some students come in and they've had, a, they've had to give them deodorant and help them brush their hair mm -hmm. and, Stuff like that, and it's really sad, and it's hard because we are privileged as white, white females. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is hard seeing it, and it's really an eye opener as well. It is, you know, I, you know, both my parents are educators as well, and the right. school that my dad works at, for example, New Hanover, it's, it's in the middle of a really bad area in Wilmington, and all of those kids that go there, there's not all of them, but a lot of them are gang affiliated, and there is it's a primarily black and Hispanic school. Right. That's like, I mean, even the high school that I went to, not so much, it was mostly my elementary school and my high school, not so much my middle school. Um, because, you know, the, the counties and the, the regions of how they had district everything and had split everything up, it had put some of the low income areas mm -hmm. into my community. And, and that was because of redlining, if you did not know that. That's right. when they do the redistricting and everything. Right. So it, it makes sense. Yeah. So what is the exact example of redlining? So I actually have it pulled up here. And the exact definition for redlining is refuse to someone because they live in an area deemed to be poor financially linked. So okay. basically it's all of these redlining. And if you can see, I have these documents pulled up, which I will pull up right here. Well, redlining is a discriminatory practice in which services, you know, financial and otherwise, are withheld from potential customers who reside in neighborhoods classified as hazardous to investment, which is the low income areas that these schools are distributing them to. And all of those schools in those areas, like I said, mm -hmm. are great and they're not getting the funding that they need. Yeah. So like I was saying, um, once, you know, my school did open up 
so so anyone could come mm -hmm. into the school as well um i know we don't get as much funding and there's the school's overcrowded it's overpopulated there's they don't have enough staff working there especially with covid as well exactly and i know there's been a lot of gang related stuff in in the past there hasn't been there has been gang related stuff until they did the redistricting and they mm -hmm. they redid all of that and the majority of them you know were a minority so the you know the majority of them were in gang related areas and then when you look at their past you know schooling and where places mm -hmm. they have been enrolled at it was those low income area schools exactly. that had poor teachers poor test grades and so, you know, whether they were coming here to get a better, better education and now it's, you know, affecting the, the higher income area schools, um, not to sound privileged, but like, I don't there know. There wasn't as many gang related things when, you yeah. know, they did get redistricted. However, you know, I see it that way, you know, if that happened to my county goal when we did our redistricting, you know, they right. redistricted all of our schools. And with my school is we had a lot of our people of color come in, like, like there was a lot more than there was, right. than there has been in the past. And so there was more fights and there was more gang related violence because in those neighborhoods, when they do the red lining, they cross lines between gang affiliated areas. Take Houston Moore, for example. Houston Moore is a really bad area. And you take Creekwood, mm -hmm. and that's also a really bad area. Mm -hmm. But those two are two different gangs, and that's right. how Wilmington works. It's just two different gangs, and they live on two different sides of the you know bad area of Wilmington. But they started mixing those schools when they did the redistricting, so a lot more violence went off. Take right. Hanover Shooting, for example. That kid, he was in a, the wrong gang or the, the other gang right, and the right. other kid, and then he shot him. Shot him right through his finger and into his hip during school. Wow. Wow. Do you think maybe if they redistricted more often and not as drastic, so it was like just each place shifted over, it would be? But then you run into people having to jump into different schools and this is, you know, yeah. so I think they should really just stick to a, a plan, a plan that has everybody, like, Everybody's in a good school, you know, they need to get obviously more funding for these lower, you know, income areas. Right, right. They need, yeah, they need yeah. to offer more, um, you know, they need to offer also more opportunities financially for these families, mm -hmm. you know, the, the state or whether it's a bunch of volunteers, you know, that get together. I feel like that would be a good service plan to help those lower income families and to help people get that better education and to get more opportunities as what, you know, someone with that's more wealthier and mm -hmm. their, their name, their family, whatever, regardless of the situation. And there, there is actually an area that is doing something like that. And mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and show you guys the website now. So this website is from teachforamerica.org and it is a author who wrote about schools around America that are trying to stop racism that goes around them. And some of these, you know, practices involved making it more inviting making it more inclusive inclusive they've made everything more inclusive they've created rooms where you know people of kids of, that are of color they mm -hmm. can go in and they can relax and if they feel that they are getting too stressed right. out and that they are getting you know the proper education they need right. and they need help where did you go say this was that and this is on teachforamerica.org and there's actually a lot of places you can go to donate to these schools okay so are the schools like you know, in North Carolina, or are they just like oh, they're all awesome. over America. All over this is America. an issue that happens wow. everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I actually want to get into what your high school experience was like. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm from a city, city area, and there are some wealthier parts, but there's also some lower parts. I live out in the country, so I'm like right in between. I am districted to a low-income school. So, you know, I definitely did see some of the people who ha were having, you know, their family was a low income family. They weren't the wealthiest of families and, you know, they needed whether it was food stamps or, you know, some form of health care. But being at my school, I saw how their grades were affected, like versus and their my grades, grades were heavily affected. Their grades were heavily affected. And that is probably the least of the dropout rate. Yeah. And also, I, I would say there's 
you know, some people that like I've seen not eating lunch, not having enough money to eat lunch, and that's sad. I always shared my food though with people. I do. I'm stingy about my food now though. I don't like to share, but that's okay. I used that's to. Okay. I used to be nice. I used to share. You used share to be with nice. Kids. You used to be nice. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, but as well as violence, there was lots of behavioral issues, and the people, I think, with. Um, the families that had the most money in the school had the highest name, you know, on the social, the social ladder that we all have an idea mm -hmm. of. Um, you know, they would almost like taunt and tease the kids who would wear the same clothes to school every day, who, you know, didn't have the best hygiene because they weren't taught better or stuff like that. And, you know, like I think that that creates low and low kids from low income families to act out. Mm -hmm. I think it causes them to act out and to draw attention because they're they're asking for help in a way, mm -hmm. you know. And I was just this this little girl, little little Caucasian girl in this big world full of so many so many different races and cultures and like you know, it was it was crazy. That's how that's where I grew up. That's how mm -hmm. my school was. I mean, that's, that's pretty much how I grew up. I grew up obviously in Wilmington, North Carolina. I think this has been a fantastic discussion on systematic yeah. racism in public education. I think we've hit a lot of good subjects, and I I'm pretty educated. You're pretty educated yeah. on the topic. Yeah. That's Thank awesome. You. Well, Thank we'll you so much for having me. Well, thanks for coming in. Yeah, I'll catch you on the flip. <laughs>